arguments in equidistribution and specifically about weak homotopy theory. Okay, so today I'm going to do a proof of the Birkhoff ergodic theorem, and what I'm going to follow is uh, Katz Nelson and Weiss's proof and a simple proof of some ergodic theorems. Okay, so I've, to save time, I've rewritten up the Birkhoff ergodic theorem. And what does the Birkhoff ergodic theorem say? It says that in the context of ergodic probability measure preserving systems, and if I have an L1 function, and I sample my L1 function over a long orbit segment, and I take its average, then this converges to the integral of the function over the whole probability space for almost every point with respect to your ergodic measure. Okay, and that's the proof we go, and we want to prove this following um, Katz, Nelson, and Weiss's proof. So maybe I'll first say a couple of things to kind of set the stage. So I'll leave these up um, and. I'm trying to sort of give you an idea of what the proof is going to be, but then I'm going to prove, do the proof in the details. So maybe if, yeah, hopefully you won't be completely lost on this, but if you are, hopefully as you see the details, you'll see the connection and I'll put the details into boxes. Okay? So one thing one could do is we could restate the Birkhoff ergodic theorem, and we could restate it as being the summation from i equals zero to n minus one of f of t to the i of x is equal to n times the integral of f d mu plus little o of n, where the constant and the little o can depend on your point x. Okay? So that's one way you could talk about it. And so what are we going to do? Um, so maybe I'll actually take a moment to do some reductions. So the first step is going to be reductions. So, um, so what are my reductions? Um, it's a basis. It's a basis to prove. It's a basis to show um, that uh, for epsilon bigger than zero, for uh, f of f positive and epsilon bigger than zero, um, if F upper bar of x equals minus soup one and f lower bar is the same thing but with a length. Okay, I'm leaving out the repeated um, notations from one line to the other. Uh, then the integral of f soup d mu is less than or equal to the integral of f d mu. something that you'd expect to be bigger, but show that it's smaller by at least a little, or not too much bigger, and something you'd expect to be smaller, but show that it's not too much smaller. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Um, so we can keep going with reductions. Observe, and so uh, f upper bar is t invariant almost everywhere. And f lower bar is t invariant almost everywhere. So this is by uh, telescoping sums with just a tiny bit of extra work. Um, okay. And so let's see. Uh, so let's assume assume. Uh, C, which is equal to the almost sure value of 
f upper bar is less than infinity. So let me just be very clear at this point, this is an unjustified assumption. Currently unjustified. Hopefully I'll have time to justify it. It's very similar to other steps that go in the proof. Um, if I don't have time to justify it, it's in the notes in step three of the proof of the Birkhoff ergodic theorem in the notes. Okay. Um, so we want to prove, so we're going to first focus on this inequality, right? We've got this other inequality on the other hand. The proofs are fairly similar of the two inequalities. So I want to talk a little bit about how to prove the first inequality. Okay. And I want to draw sort of a schematic proof. So um, intuition. or um, integral of f upper bar d mu less than or equal to the integral of f d mu plus epsilon. Great. So that's what I want to do. And so what's the idea? The idea is what I consider is I consider the integral of the summation from i equals 0 to n minus 1 of f of t to the i of x d mu. And this is going to be equal to the n times the integral of f d mu. And this is just by measure preserving, right? For each individual term, this is going to be the integral of f after a change of variables of the push forward of t by t to the mu by t to the i. But because I'm measure preserving, that's the same number. It's the same integral, okay? Um, and so we have this. Everybody okay with that? Okay, so this is where you're able to bring in the limb soup. So what's the next idea? The next idea is to organize the sum into pieces uh, the summation, let's say from j, i equals j to k of f of t to the i of x which is roughly equal to k times uh, c. And in fact, to be a little bit more precise, it's bigger than k times c minus epsilon. Ah, and I'm lying to you. It's k minus j plus 1 times c minus epsilon. I think that the red color is not the best one. Oh, OK, thank you. I'll not use that anymore. Blue? Uh, even worse. <laughs> okay. No, no problem. Let's stick to white. Color chalk isn't helpful if it's invisible. Oh, yeah. Let's just do it this way. Okay. So that's the idea. So if I look at t to the j of x, there's going to be some stopping time where it's pretty close to the lim soup multiplied by the number of sum ends, right? And so this is the big idea, okay? Maybe a picture is often worth a thousand words. Can people see if I draw on this line here? Okay, nobody protested. So if I think about this, so I've got n minus one points here. I first put it into a block where I'm close to f upper bar of x. So, that the, so this will be from uh, i equals 0 to say i equals to, let's say, n1, minus 1, maybe. And this, will, I, wanna be, I want it to be close to f upper bar of x times n. Okay. And there's some value where that's going to be true because you get to the one soup, right? So if you multiply both sides by n, you have to be getting close to it at some finite stage. Everybody okay with that? Who's with me at this point? This is sort of the main idea of the talk. Almost nobody. Okay, that's great, thanks. Um, yeah, so let's do some preliminaries. Okay, so now uh, if the little soup 
of f of 1 over n of the summation of i equals 0 to n minus 1 of f of t to the i of x is equal to some c, then there exists n1 comma n2 comma dot 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 so that uh, 1 over n sub j summation from i equals 0 up to n sub j minus 1 of f of t to the i of x uh, converges to c. Okay, everybody happy about this? Okay. Now, of course, I can multiply through by n sub j. Did orange work? The color I used there. Yeah. Okay, orange was a good color. So what I can do is I can multiply through by n sub j. Okay, and what I can do is I can say this is bigger than n sub j times c minus epsilon. Let's reorganize so it looks better. Everybody okay with that? Okay, and that will be true for all large enough j. So that's sort of the reformulation in terms of what was written over here. All right, so on this chunk, I'm roughly equal to the number of pieces times the limb soup at that point, because otherwise it wouldn't be the limb soup if there wasn't such a term. Everybody okay with that? Who's with me at this point? Okay, great. Okay, now the next thing I do is, it, so here's now the big idea. The big idea is I've got another point here. So this is going to now be t to the n one of x. Okay, and I can repeat the same exact thing where this is going to be, I can get a point n two minus one. So uh, let's write it this way. Let's write it as n one plus n two minus one. And I can write this as being roughly n2 times f upper bar of t to the n1 of x. Right? I do, rather than starting at x, now I just do the same exact argument for where I'm starting, which is t to the n1 of x. Everyone okay with this? All right, so now we're sort of in business. Um, so I can start splitting up these, the, the sum into pieces where it's almost the limb soup. And the hope is that you sum those pieces together and you recover a bound for the integral. Right? That's the idea of the proof. Let's now do the details. Because you should all be very skeptical at this point. Actually, you shouldn't be because you know I prepared this lecture. But in general, if like, you came up with this idea, there's a lot of details to check. So now let's do it. It shouldn't be obvious at this stage. Does anybody want to ask a question at this stage? Okay, so let's move on and let's make an unjustified simplifying assumption to kind of capture this idea in a simpler setting. Okay, so uh, step one. Leftmost inequality. Uh, with an unjustified and there's no justifying the simplifying assumption. It's just to capture the idea. This is an absurd assumption. There's sort of no reason to do it. You shouldn't believe this assumption is true. It just is to show the argument a little cleaner, and then we need to introduce one more idea to do the argument when you actually, in the relevant situation. Okay? So this assumption is only currently unjustified. This assumption is unjustifiable. Okay? Uh, so with an unjustified simplifying assumption. Um, so let's assume assume that for all epsilon for each uh, epsilon bigger than zero, there exists. Uh, 
zero less than n less than this big n so that do this so that the summation from i equals zero uh, 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 let's assume that for each epsilon bigger than zero and x and x there exists the da -da -da -da, so that the summation from i equals zero up to n little n minus one of f of t to the i of x is greater than c minus epsilon. Everyone happy with what this assumption is saying? So this is the value that I'm going to in the limb soup if I divide it by n, so I'm just sliding the n over to the other side, multiplying both sides by n as before. I've given up a little bit of an epsilon, so I know at some finite scale I get there, but that finite scale could be arbitrarily large depending on my x, but I'm assuming it's not. I'm assuming it's uniformly bounded over all x, which of course, unjustifiable. But let's capture this. So that's equivalent in the schematic picture of saying that there's a uniform bound on these window sizes that I'm looking at. Everybody okay with this? I'm sorry. So, so it seems to me that uh, you're saying for all x, for all x, there exists an n. Oh yeah. So let's call it n max. Uh, n sub x epsilon. I fixed epsilon. I fixed x. Then there exists this n less than this big n. Oh, I see. Uh, I see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was confused for a moment. Okay. Uh, well, epsilon bigger than zero, there exists an n, so that for all x and x, there exists a zero less than n less than n. And just so capital N depends on epsilon, lowercase n depends on x. Thank you very much. Okay, everyone happy about that? Once again, thanks. All right. So now let's get to the proof. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider the summation. What we do is we consider the summation from i equals zero of L sub n minus one of f of t to the i of x. And the claim is that this is bigger than or equal to L n minus n times c minus epsilon. <coughs> Okay, so this is the term coming from the loom soup. I've given up just a little bit, and I've got almost as many terms. I just have to subtract the maximal size of the window, and I can bound from above in this fashion. Everyone happy about this? So I'm just claiming that this inequality is true, and I'm going to justify it in a minute. Uh, let's just observe that this inequality will be, will give us this inequality, right? You'll divide through both sides by ln. You have a minus epsilon at the end of it. Uh, this term goes to zero um, as you let L go to infinity. And so you'll have this. Okay, so this requires a little bit of notation. And what's the notation to do? It's basically to choose these partitioning into window sizes. So I need to pick the starting places, and then I need to pick the number of summands. Um, everyone okay with that? Okay, so let's start with the definition. So definition, let uh, n of x be equal to the minimum of a set of j greater than zero so that uh, one over j summation from i equals zero up to j minus one of f of t to the i of x is greater than c minus epsilon. And so keep in mind n of x under our unjustifiable simplifying assumption, n of x is less than capital N. Everybody happy about this? Okay. So that set me up to get my n sub 1. But now I need to get this starting point and going to the next thing. So I need to do some annoying notation. So uh, recursively define, um, recursively, uh, 
Oh, let x sub 0. Recursively. Let x sub j plus 1 be equal to uh, t to the n of x sub j of x sub j. Let's go back over to the schematic picture and talk through what's going on here. So this is my x sub 0, and let's think about what x sub 1 is. Well, I'm going to look at n of x, that's my n1 here, t to the n1 of x of x sub 0, so that's going to be the starting point of the next piece. Now the next window size will be the relevant n for t to the n1 of x, right? So then x sub 2 will be the start of the next window. Everybody okay with that? So maybe I'll just put that in, in color. So this will be x sub 0. This will be x sub 1. This will be here, will be x sub 2, and so forth. So it'll be the starting point of each of the windows. Okay. Um, and let a, if j be, let a be equal to the maximum of the set of j, so that the summation from i equals 0 to j of n of x sub i is less than l sub n. So what is this? This is the number of windows that are entirely contained in my segment. So I can repeat this infinitely often, and I get infinitely many windows. I only want to look at the, the number of windows that appear in my chunk of size n. Is everybody OK with this? Who understands what I mean when I say the word window? Oh, OK, cool. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, great. All right. Uh, and let b be equal to the summation from j, e j equals 0 up to a of n of x sub j. Okay? And note that this is less than L sub n. Okay. Everybody okay with that? That's going to be, I'm looking at all of the windows that land completely in here, and I look at where those windows end. So after B, there's the start of a window that goes beyond the world in which I'm looking at. I'm only looking in some finite segment, and you can think of B as being the, the starting point for the window that's only partially contained in the region I'm looking at. Everybody okay with that? All right, so now, we're, now we've got enough notation to make a proof. Um, oh, and also notice, And maybe to connect this to the unjustified simplifying assumption, I'll write ln minus n is less than b. Okay. Because if it wasn't, you'd be able to add another window, because the biggest window is size n. Everybody OK with that? Great. All right. So now I think we're in business. So we have that the summation from i equals 0 up to b um, minus 1 of f of t to the i of x is equal to the summation uh, from k equals 0 up to a minus a of the summation from uh, i equals 0 up to n of x of j n of x of k minus 1 of f of t to the i of x. All right, so I've just sort of, um, oh, and this is an x sub k. So what am I doing? I'm re representing my big long sum here in terms of, gesundheit, in terms of the pieces over the window. So I tell you the starting point of the sum that comes from this x sub k here. And how long it goes is how long it needs to go in order to be, a big, to be a window that has a big sum. Everybody okay with this? Great. Okay, so now the big observation here, the whole point of this setup, um, let's try green chalk. 
Please tell me if this is not very, I'm guessing this is not very visible, am I correct? Okay, so we'll just do white. Okay, the point of this is that this is bigger than uh, n of x sub k times c minus epsilon. That was how, why everything was set up. The whole point was to get this expression where I have n, sub, n of x sub k sums and, I'm, and they dom, it's dominated by something very close to the, the number of the limb soup times the number of sums. That was the whole point of what we've been doing up until now. Everybody okay with this? And of course, there's totally b of these things. So the whole thing now, so what we get is that we get that this is greater than b times c minus epsilon. Everybody okay with this? And in turn, this is going to be this is going to be greater than or equal to L n minus n times c minus epsilon. Okay. Is everybody happy about this? Okay, and now we're basically done. Um, is is it okay if I erase this scratch work where I talked about the limb soups and almost attaining them and multiplied through on the other side? Great. Um, okay, so now what we have is we've got the summation from i equals zero to L S minus one of f of t to the i of x is greater than or equal to, uh, let's just, greater than L n minus n times C minus epsilon. Okay. Everybody happy about this? And it's because that f is positive. This is f is positive, which I think I wrote somewhere. Did I do that? Uh, yes, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just makes the, yeah, it saves a lot of trouble. And by considering the difference of two positive functions, you can handle the uh, general case of a function. Okay. Is everyone happy that this gives me the first inequality, or should I divide through by ln and explain L times n and explain it? Who would like me to do that? Oh, fantastic. Okay, great. Okay. So now we've justified um, this step here. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to um, remove the unjustified assumption. So now let's prove, so step two, Uh, proof of first inequality without unjustifiable assumption but still assuming Uh, f soup is less than infinity almost everywhere. Okay. Um, the proof that you can assume this basically follows from the argument we're going to give. So I, I, looking at the time, I'm not going to be able to prove this. It's in the notes. It's step three of the notes. Um, and the proof is very much like the proof of step two. Okay. All right. So... So the proof is really going to be about a trick. So what is being dropped here? What's being dropped is the fact that I have a uniform bound on this n. Okay? And why was that used? That showed up here to give me a uniform, to give me this part here, which showed up very nicely here. Okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do something very, very silly. I'm going to change the definition of n to be some n tilde, where if it has to be too big, I'm just going to pretend that it's 1. Okay? And I'm going to have that for most of the points, we still have that n of x will be less, less than some giant capital N, which I'll choose so it'll be true on most of the points. And I'm really going to need to use the integral, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to integrate this expression, and on pieces where I can check the orbits, I'll have an estimate like I had above here. I'll have an estimate like this piece. 
And on the other pieces, I'll just estimate by the integral of my function over the set where I've changed the value of n. Okay? And that's at most zero, and I'll be able to just kind of throw that out from consideration, and that won't really make any problem for me. Okay, that's how the proof's gonna go. All right, so let's now get to it. Okay, um, let, so proof. Let a sub n be equal to the set of x so that n of x is greater than n. And so let's observe that the measure of a sub n goes to zero as capital N goes to infinity. Is everyone happy about that? Um, and let m tilde of x be equal to n of x if x is not in a sub n and one else. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to define the sequence in exactly the same way, but for n tildes rather than uh, my n's. So recursively, uh, so let x tilde sub zero be equal to x, and recursively uh, x tilde sub j plus one be equal to t to the n tilde of x sub j of x sub j. The tilde and the tilde. So I'm just repeating the definition I saw before, but with n tilde in place of n, and I'm putting tildes over everything in sight. All right. Okay, uh, we'll define a tilde. A tilde and b tilde similarly. Is everyone happy with what I mean by them or should I write out the definitions? Okay. Um, okay, so now we repeat the previous argument. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to consider uh, the summation from i equals zero up to uh, ln uh, minus one. So we just to make sure, capital N is fixed for the moment. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah. So capital N is fixed. Yeah, thank you very much for this. Let's maybe make an aside. Basically, uh, at the very end of the proof, we'll choose n big enough so that the measure is small enough. Thanks for the question. Okay, any other questions at this point? Great, okay. Uh, so now this is going to be as before, equal to very similar, but just, uh, so this is going to be greater than or equal to the summation from i equals zero up to a tilde of the summation, oh, let's do k equals zero to a tilde, of the summation from i equals zero to n tilde of x sub k tilde uh, minus one of f of t to the i of x sub k tilde. All right, everybody happy currently? With this setup, it's just all the same kind of just regrouping and using the positivity of f as before. Okay, so now I wanna look at this object and what I would like to say is I would like to say that this is greater than um, n tilde of x tilde sub k times c minus epsilon. But that's not necessarily true. 
So I'm going to put or in big capital letters, x sub k tilde sub k is an a sub n. Everybody happy about that? Okay. Uh, okay. So now I, uh, yeah, so now what I can do is I can uh, rewrite this as, okay, so now the claim is that that's what I'm for. So you do this summation from uh, k equals zero to a tilde of the summation from i equals zero to n tilde of x of k tilde minus one of f of t to the i of x is greater than, now we have the summation from, uh, let's just call this uh, b tilde, minus the cardinality of the set of i's less than or equal to a. Let's call them k's less than or equal to a. So that x of k is an a sub n. Okay. Times c minus epsilon. Okay, so this, my claim is that this follows immediately from what I wrote here. So whenever I get my c minus epsilon, that meant that the relevant x sub k was not an a sub n, and all of those terms contribute to my b tilde, and I subtract those where I can't um, use it, which is exactly when x sub k is an a sub n, and on those I estimate trivially by just saying they're zero. Everybody happy about this? Anybody happy about this? Great. Okay. Cool. So now we're basically done. So now we have that the uh, integral of the summation from i equals zero up to uh, l sub n minus one of f of t to the i of x d mu. This isn't tight. Is greater than or equal to L sub n times C minus epsilon minus L sub n times the measure of uh, A sub n. Sorry, this should be L sub n. All right, so let's talk through why this is true. So I'm integrating, so this is the big difference between the whole space, between the previous step. In the previous step, I never really needed to use the integral. It was really a constant, the integral was a consequence of the pointwise estimate. This business where I'm worried about whether or not I land an A sub n or not, is why I need to use the integral. I need to use that to control what's happening on the a sub x. Okay? So whenever I'm not in the a sub n, I've got this c minus epsilon uh, estimate. Now because I've truncated the value that my n can take by making it one if it had to have been too big, I still have that I have my, this number b is at least l sub n minus n. That was the point of defining n sub tilde. That is still at least L sub n minus n. Everybody okay with that? All right. So now on pieces going through the sum, I'm estimating by C minus epsilon, except for the parts that were in A sub n, and moreover, it's the starting point of one of the windows for n tilde, one of the n tilde windows. The measure of those is at most the measure of A sub n, because I need two conditions to be satisfied. I need to have my point land in a, B in A sub n, that's bounded by A sub n, and there's an additional condition that it needs to be some x sub k for some k. That's an extra assumption. So uh, 
It's at most the measure of a sub n. It turns out that, yeah, yeah. Okay, and so this is the estimate that you have. And uh, so if n is large enough, this is uh, L sub n times C minus epsilon minus L sub n times epsilon. Okay, and that's just because these guys go to zero. Okay, and maybe I proved the inequality that I've now erased. Oh, I think I might have written it somewhere. It survived. Um, okay, but in any case, uh, uh, oh yeah, I proved it. I, I wrote it here. Now, we don't have this for epsilon. We have it for two epsilon, but hopefully everyone's happy about that. Okay, any questions at this point? This, is, this has already captured essentially all of the ideas of the proof. It's a great time for questions. Great. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so I just want to quickly talk through um, my unjustified assumption that f, that up, upper f is less than infinity. Assume it's not. Make it be much bigger than the average value of my L1 function of f. I can repeat all of these steps before with these, uh, with um, getting the the sum of my points to be not bigger than c minus epsilon, but bigger than this enormous threshold I've chosen. I can define my n tildes as before, and then what I can do is I can show that the integral is bigger than the integral is, and that's a contradiction. By truncating my sum, not by when I'm close to the, the limb soup, but where I'm just as big as I want it to be, bigger than 10 billion or something. Everyone okay with that? Like I said, this is also in the notes in step three. All right, so now I can do one of two things. I can do the other side of the inequality, which is, um, uh, yeah, the other side of the inequality uses just one additional trick, um, which is using that it's uniformly integrable, that the integral over a sub n can be, the integral of f over a sub n can be chosen to be as small as you want. Okay, or I can talk about the connections of this proof to sort of other results. Who would like me to do the right-hand side of the inequality? Further inequality? Okay, so then I'll talk about the co connection to other results. Okay, so, uh, so step three and notes. Uh, Lim soup. Uh, yeah, well, let's write it this way. F upper x is less than infinity almost everywhere. And then step four in notes, it uses that uh, the integral over F lower bar d mu um, is greater than the integral of F d mu. I need to add the two epsilon here. So. Okay, so that's what I left out. Um, and so it's basically the same exact proof, but it uses the fact that um, for all epsilon bigger than zero, there exists a delta bigger than zero. So that if the measure of B is less than delta, then the integral of f mu is less than epsilon over me. Okay, so that's the sort of only extra thing you need to use. Um, um, Sorry. Can I ask a yeah, yeah, please. So assumption one was that f upper bar had an almost sure value that is finite. Yes. Right? But why does it have an almost sure value? T invariance and ergodicity. Uh, Okay. Yeah, thank you for that question. So for almost every x, it's, it's t invariant. Only one value. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so let's make some remarks. Okay, so there's another version of the Birkhoff ergodic theorem. So, uh, theorem.
And what does this third work of a guide theorem say? It says uh, x comma mu comma t, t invariant, t, uh, invariant, not necessarily ergodic. Measure preserving uh, system. Okay. Um, then uh, the summation from i equals zero up to n minus one and over n of f of t to the i of x uh, limit exists and is t invariant. Okay, but I don't know what it is necessarily, but it's just something that depends on your value on a set of full measure, but the limit exists. And the same proof can give that, because you assume the limit doesn't exist. Okay, then you consider the limb soup of your f uh, 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 of these sums. Consider the limb soup of it and the limb inf of it. Those are different, right? Um, this. And then what you do is you use this sort of argument to prove, to bound the summation of f of t to the i of x. The integral of this, you relate, you once again bound it by the integral of um, m plus 1. You bound it by m times f upper of x minus epsilon. Where this now depends on x. Everybody okay with that? So that's sort of the idea of the proof. Um, so it's still very much the same proof, but you attain a slightly more general result where you treat, treat any invariant measure. Okay. Let's keep going and mention the theorem of Kingman that was mentioned in um, Adam's talk earlier today. Assume F one comma da 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 having x to R. Oh, I also want as before x comma mu comma t ergodic measure preserving. Um, uh, and let's assume that they're in L1. So that uh, F sub N plus M of X is less than or equal to F sub N of X plus F sub N of T to the N of X. Okay. So this is a condition, this is the sub-additivity condition of this. Then the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n of f sub n of x exists for almost every x and is uh, the limit as n goes to infinity of the integral of 1 over n of f n d. So that's uh, Kingman's ergodic theorem. In one direction, our proof can go through. In the other direction, sort of is more formally close to the Ber a consequence of the Birkhoff ergodic theorem. OK, so one direction follows from the previous proof. Um, that the integral of the limb inf of 1 over n f sub n of x plus epsilon is greater than or equal to the limit 
of the integral of 1 over n of s of t. Okay? In the previous, you repeat the previous argument, but equality of the sums of the f sub n's is replaced by a greater than or equal to, and that only helps. Okay? The inequality only helps. Greater than or equal to sub, from subadditivity. Only helps. Everybody happy about that? Um, okay, I don't think I have enough time to talk a little bit about how the other direction of the Kingman zergotic theorem follows from the Burkhoff ergodic theorem. So I'll just stop here. But please feel free to ask me about it <coughs> if you're interested. <sighs> So I have just one specific question because you <laughs> said a few times about two directions of Kingman's theorem. So <laughs> there are the two parts of Kingman's theorem. So could you specifically tell us what you mean by the two parts? Oh, I, uh, I'm saying it's equal to this. Right. So um, what you want to say so is that it's great than, greater than or equal to or less than or equal to. And so this is the greater than or equal to the limit, and then it's less than or equal to the one soup. But the, the, the fact that it's a soup doesn't really show up in the other direction. Um, yeah, did that make sense? Thank you for that question. That's very helpful. And maybe one more second. Yeah, yeah. No, please, please. So this is a question. So uh, in the proof that you gave us, because I'm not mm -hmm. where do we see the maximum inequality? I think in the integral. I think it's showing up when we take the integral. And in, so towards the end of step two, where you take the integral and you're sort of estimating by this. Um, I think also if you study and you think about the cases where x sub k is not showing up, it's very much like the statement on leaders. Did that make sense? Okay. So I see that all the other questions are postponed for coffee, so thank you very much once again. We continue in 20 minutes. Yes. Does the uh, proof also give a ZD version of the ergodic term? I don't know. Because they usually, I mean, they exist. So. so